what I find interesting about all of it is, you know, there's this sense that you hear. I mean, even Pope Francis talks mm-hmm. about the church is not just another NGO. Um, I mean, I always, you know, heard growing up, you know, there are all kinds of people who do good deeds, but doing good deeds won't get you into heaven unless you have a relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. But the flip of that is, as you see very clearly in Matthew 25, I mean, you can believe, but if you're a terrible person, you're not going to heaven. Sorry. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another uplifting and redemptive episode of On the Journey. Redemptive in a kind of a literal sense this week. I'm Matt Swaim, Ken Hensley along with us as well, my colleague. We're both with the Coming Home Network. If you don't know much about our work, we work with people at every stage of interest in the Catholic Church and help them kind of connect dots and uh, answer questions. Of course, Ken was a former Baptist pastor. Me, I just played in a bunch of bands in the evangelical world. We both came into the Catholic faith as adults and... uh, we're kind of discussing that here on uh, on the journey every episode. So, Ken, are you ready for more sola fide discussion? Yes, I I am ready. I'm I'm wondering since you were a Methodist, I'm wondering why you don't have a more methodical um, road leading into the Catholic Church. Well, Can you explain. There was it was more madness than method, Ken. That was the issue. Okay, more madness okay. than method. Yeah, I'm ready to talk about it. I'm I'm more than ready. Well, good because we've done two episodes on this question of sola fide, and we've barely even touched St. Paul. So let's remedy that today. Let's get us started. We're going to barely begin into St. Paul today. But okay, to set the stage, just want to, I guess, remind those who are listening or those who are new listening, we're talking about our stories and how we came um, to the Catholic faith. And I was in the Reformed tradition of Protestantism. My conversion from Protestantism to Catholicism was really rooted, more than anything, in coming to believe that the two foundational issues upon which the Reformers stood, sola scriptura, scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice, and sola fide, justification by faith alone in the legally imputed righteousness of Christ, taught by Luther, Calvin, and Protestant sense, it was coming to believe that they were just simply wrong on these issues. Biblically wrong, historically wrong, theologically wrong. And, and not I just, devoted, as, I was about to say, and not just that Luther and Calvin were wrong, but that you personally were wrong, which is kind yeah. of a much, it's one thing to say this guy back then was wrong. It's another thing to yeah. think, oh my, I'm wrong. Yeah, that, that's right. That the position is simply wrong. Now, you and I have devoted about 14 episodes really to talking about Sola Scriptura, and there's more that we could say, and we'll be coming back to it, I'm sure. Um, we were describing how it unraveled in our lives. Well, over the weeks going forward, I want to talk about how sola fide unraveled for me. And here's how it began. I came to see, first of all, that through the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, both faith and the obedience that flows from faith were required in order to receive God's blessing. Noah had to trust God and he had to build the ark in order to be saved. That, that's just patently obvious. Abraham had to trust God, and he had to leave Ur of the Chaldees and follow in order to receive the inheritance of the land. Moses, the children of Israel, they had to trust God and sacrifice the lamb and leave Egypt, on and on and on. Faith and obedience. In every case, I came to see this pattern that was so clear in the Old Testament. The pattern was faith leading to obedience, resulting in God's blessing. Okay, so what's the issue? What's the problem with that? It seems so clear. Well, the problem was that this pattern, faith leading to obedience, resulting in God's blessing, is the pattern that I was taught as a Reformed Protestant to view as the very definition of legalism and a legalistic approach to God or a legalistic relationship with God. Because at the heart of the Reformation doctrine of justification by faith alone is this claim that our obedience cannot be a condition. You hear that? It cannot be a condition for receiving God's blessing. Salvation must be, by faith alone, nothing more than the open hand reaching out, or grace is overturned, and the gospel becomes 
quote, a damning system of works righteousness, unquote. Uh, that's quoting John MacArthur, well-known Reformed pastor and teacher and author. In fact, here's how MacArthur puts this issue and the importance of it. The difference between Rome and the Reformers is not theological hair-splitting. A right understanding of justification by faith is the very foundation of the gospel. You cannot go wrong at this point without corrupting every other doctrine as well. And that is why every different gospel is under the eternal curse of God. And of course, he's referring to the Roman Catholic teaching on salvation when he says every different gospel is under the eternal curse of God. Except you read these Old Testament stories and it doesn't seem to have been an issue that obedience is a condition for receiving God's blessing. You read the accounts of these Old Testament stories as they're related in the New Testament, in particular the book of Hebrews chapter 11, or especially, it doesn't seem to be an issue. There's no issue, Matt. I mean, never is there a hint that somehow the requirement of obedience, along with faith, is somehow tainting you know, the gracious nature of God's gift. Or that those who receive his gift then, by being obedient and faithful, now have reason to boast in their accomplishment. None of this is in their minds, apparently. In fact, when we read these stories related in Hebrews chapter 11, they are uniformly presented as illustrations of precisely how God wants us to relate to him. They're set forth as models that we should emulate. And I began to wonder, why aren't Noah and Moses and Abraham and David and all the rest, why aren't they presented as illustrations of how God doesn't want us to relate to him? Why aren't they presented as examples of legalism? Why aren't they presented as examples of, you know, in the olden days, you know, we had the law and that's how, that's why Noah and Abraham and yeah. you know, everybody, they were dealing with an imperfect kind of relationship with God, but now we have Jesus. And so we can forget all of that. No, they're still held up even by Jesus himself as the models of faith. And what's interesting is that even though I would hear things like this about how it's, it's, you know, faith alone, mm -hmm. um, in my particular tradition, which was not Reformed, it was Wesleyan Holiness, there was still this, you know, like many Christians, uh, this idea that you had to respond in obedience. And we always, I mean, I can't count how many times I heard the sermon yeah. illustration, you know, of the lady who's in a house and the floods coming through and the, you know, National Guard comes by with the Jeep and says, she's she's praying for God to save her from the flood. Yeah. The Jeep comes by, she's like, no, God's going to save me. Floodwaters rise higher. The dinghy comes by and says, get on the boat. She says, no, God's going to save me. And then she climbs to the top of the house as the waters rise. The helicopter comes. She says, no, God's going to save me. She dies, goes to heaven, says to God, why didn't you save me? He says, well, I sent you a tank and a dinghy and a helicopter, and you turned me down all three times, right? That there's got to be that yeah. kind of relationship. And I think that even if we sort of practically understand that, at the theological level, uh, this would be something that the reformers, especially Luther and Calvin, would have said, you know, the the faith aspect overrides everything else. Um, yeah, because because of the nature of justification, which we will get to, but justification is the legal crediting of righteousness to our account. It occurs the moment you first believe. And so it can't have anything. I mean, what you do after that in your life, your obedience or your lack thereof can't be a condition for it. But anyway, yes, uh, you, you know, I, I began to wonder at this point, just, to, just this first step, really, I, I began to think things like, why are Protestant pastors always preaching about these Old Testament people and presenting them in a positive light if the relationship that they had with God is precisely the, the kind of relationship we want to make sure no one has now, you know? That is, tr needing to trust God and do what God says in order to receive his blessing. If we call that legalism now, then why would we hold them up as examples? So it wouldn't be simply that their relationship was imperfect, it would be that the relationship is the re, is the uh, the absolute opposite of what we want now. Yeah, the anyway, antithesis. Yeah, this was the first step. Okay, step two came over time because as I finished seminary, my seminary education, and I wound up entering into the Protestant ministry, and I began to spend a great deal of time every week in Scripture, in preparation for preaching, in preparation for teaching, I was continually struck by the sheer number of New Testament passages that seemed to present the same basic pattern that I had seen in the Old Testament of faith leading to obedience resulting 
and blessing. For instance, reading through the Gospels, I began to notice how often Jesus speaks of obedience as though it were the key to whether or not one will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, yes, Jesus speaks of faith. There's no doubt. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me will never die. Faith comes up again and again. But more often, if we're honest readers, more often, Jesus speaks of obedience. Luke 14, 26, just, just sort of take these in. If any man would come after me, in another version, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, unless someone think, oh, well, the will of our Father in heaven is simply that we believe in him. It's faith alone. Right after that, in Matthew 7, verses 24 and following, Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount by saying, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, and he said many, many things, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the one who hears these words and acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain falls, the storm comes, and the rock sta- I mean, the house stands because it's been founded on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Pretty hard to read that and think, well, he just means... Uh, your life won't be as great as it could be, but you're still going to heaven. You're it's fine. It's also also hard for me to hear it without thinking of that song we used to sing in Sunday school. You know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. You ever do that one? Uh, no? Yes, I remember that. Rains yes. came down and the floods came up. Yeah. Okay. Now, now it's in your head for the rest of the week, Ken. I'm sorry. Well, here's one that I would like to be in our heads. John 15, 10. Jesus saying, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. I mean, what a statement. And just earlier in that same chapter, he's been talking about, you know, he's been saying, abide in me. And he's been talking about how those who abide in him, that the Father will trim them so that they produce more fruit. But those who don't abide in him are what? They're cut off and they're thrown into the fire. And right right after that, he says, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. And then just one more, Matthew 25. This is that passage where Jesus describes the eternal destiny of, of really every human being, the goats and the sheep, as though it will be determined by their good deeds or lack thereof. Determined. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was a naked. You clothed me. I was in prison. You know how it goes. Yeah. It goes on and on and on, and what I find interesting about all of it is, you know, there's this sense that you hear. I mean, even Pope Francis talks about mm-hmm. the church is not just another NGO. Um, I mean, I always, you know, heard growing up, you know, there are all kinds of people who do good deeds, but doing good deeds won't get you into heaven unless you have a relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. But the flip of that is, as you see very clearly in Matthew 25, I mean, you can believe but if you're a terrible person, you're not going to heaven. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean. Yeah. yeah, that's what he's saying. And, uh, you know, some would respond and say, well, you know, Jesus here is just setting forth the requirements of a law. And uh, he's doing it to scare people. He's doing it to drive his Jewish hearers to feel their need for grace so that he can then turn around and say, actually, salvation is by faith alone. Except he never says that. Yeah, it, it just <laughs> never happens. Yeah, that's the right. problem with that. And, you know. I thought about this a great deal, Matt. I I, I try to put myself in the situation. Here's Jesus. He's speaking to crowds of simple people. We're talking men, women, children, many of them illiterate, no doubt. He's telling them, if you just read his words, he's telling them that to enter eternal life, they need to believe in him, faith, and they need to follow him, obedience. Take up their cross. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. If any man will not take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. These are the things that he's saying to him and saying to to the people. And here's the question I found myself asking. If Jesus really wanted these simple folk to know that salvation is by faith alone, completely apart from obedience, the need completely apart from the need to do anything, how could he look them in the eyes and speak in the ways he speaks so often and just leave them hanging? 
I mean, how could he give them the clear impression that their eternal destiny is going to be determined by this total response he's calling for of faith and obedience and following, turning from sin, all of that? How could he give them the clear impression that their destiny is based on this without ever feeling the need to correct the impression? And this goes back to that whole question of the perspicacity of Scripture, the clearness of Scripture. Mm -hmm. What is the clearest thing that it seems to be that Jesus is saying? You know what? Are you going to be actual you know, children of Abraham? Then follow me. Be my disciple. Take up your cross. Take care of one another. Love God. Love neighbor. Keep the commandments. I mean... Yeah, and he says all those things, doesn't he? He says all those again things. Again and again. Yeah. So, so yeah, talking about the perspicacity of Scripture, because that's one of the... That, that's one of the points that's included in the idea of sola scriptura, is that the Bible's clear. Well, taken at face value, um, the clear teaching of Jesus, the actual preaching of Jesus, that is the words he actually says, seem to me to reflect the same essential pattern that I had come to see in the stories of Noah and Abraham and Moses and the rest. Believe in me, do what I ask you to do, and you will inherit the promises. Yeah, you are my friends if you do what I tell you, <laughs> right? Another yes, another one. Beautiful. I mean, it's pretty yeah. straightforward. Yeah, you are my friends. I have a friend who's a priest who says if he ever gets to be a bishop, that's going to be his episcopal motto. You are my friends if you do as I command you. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be his. <laughs> yeah. That's good. He'll never be a bishop. <laughs> okay, and then there was Paul, though. Okay, supposedly the very apostle of justification by faith alone, and I can't go deeply into him today, but we are going to look a little bit. Okay. His letter to the Galatians, all right? This is one of two letters that are focused specifically on insisting that we must be justified by faith in Christ and not by works. And I apologize up front for those of you who are saying, yeah, yeah, now this is what we want to get into because this is going to We're be We're going to still week's... just only scratch the surface of Paul here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is going to be next week's episode, okay? The question I want to ask is this. Okay, Paul is focused on teaching justification by faith alone, not by works, in the book of Galatians. So why does Paul decide to conclude his letter to the Galatians, basically conclude it, it's in chapter 6, by describing eternal life as though it were the result, even the reward, <laughs> of perseverance in doing good? Listen, listen to what he says. So now he's wrapping it up. Chapter 6, verses 6, I'm beginning at verse 6, Paul says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, let me paraphrase what Paul is saying to them. I could paraphrase it like, like this. Hey, Galatians. Now that I'm starting to wrap up this letter, whatever I've said to you about faith and works and their relationship to justification so far, make sure that you don't misunderstand me. In the end, whatever a man sows, this is what he's going to reap. You need to sow to the Spirit if you want to reap the harvest of eternal life. And how does one sow to the Spirit? Well, Paul tells us, let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we shall reap the harvest of eternal life if we do not lose heart. And we, we, it's so easy to forget that um, letters to the Galatians, letters to somebody, the Corinthians is another fantastic example of this. These are occasional letters where Paul is correcting an error that is prevalent in that particular community. And with the Galatians, the stupid Galatians... The foolish Galatians, as Paul calls them out of the grace. I mean, he's like, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. You idiots! That's literally how the book of Galatians begins. They are objectifying the concept of circumcision and thinking that if you just go through these motions and basically, they're, they're treating it like a magic spell or they're objectifying the work. Mm -hmm. And Paul's trying to get the thing back on balance. Yeah, and what you're saying here about the documents being occasional documents written usually to correct a misunderstanding. This is going to be very important when we ask the question, um, which, which will be next week, when we ask the question, so what is Paul talking about when he says not by works or not by works of the law? What is and, a work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so in Galatians, though, supposedly he's teaching justification by faith alone, as reformers, as the reformers and reformed Protestants understand it. And yet he concludes his letter with a strong statement about what it means to sow to the Spirit, to not grow weary in doing good, and that that's how you will reap a harvest of eternal life. But then Romans, okay? Here's Paul in the letter thought by Luther and Protestant sense to be absolutely devoted above all of his writings to teaching justification by faith alone. In just one little passage, verses 6 and 7 from chapter 2, God will render to, it sounds a lot like Galatians already, God will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now, I could go on with quotations from James, from the letters of Peter, from Jude, from John, from the book of Revelation. But what I'm saying is this. It became clear to me, Matt, that the New Testament is literally filled with passages that speak of obedience as though it were a condition. Often the most important condition to whether or not one will inherit eternal life. And all of these passages had to be explained in some way. Um, but we'll come back to that. Then one more set of passages, one more type uh, or kind of passages that I found in the New Testament that created tension in my mind with the idea that justification is by faith alone and that it's something that is accomplished the instant we first believe. And what I'm talking about here are those passages scattered throughout the New Testament that seem to so clearly teach that it is possible for one who has come to faith in Christ to fall away. And for you, as someone who would have believed in once saved, always saved, mm -hmm. you would have had like alternate explanations uh, for these, as you just mentioned, uh, you would about those, you know, persevere in doing good verses. For me, as a free will person who believed that you could lose your salvation, the verses you're about to invoke were like just, visible from space, right? So you could just hear them. You could just I, hear them. I, I memorize a bunch of these verses. Um, okay. Just because it was just a reminder that you don't want to backslide. Yeah. You don't want to fall away. You don't want to lose your salvation because we've, in the Wesleyan holiness tradition, especially the holiness part of it, that stuff was real. I mean, these things leapt off the page at you as warnings to persevere. Yeah. In fact, I remember during my struggles as a Protestant pastor when I picked up one of uh, Wesley's volumes and I read it, and it was on this subject. And he just started rattling off these passages one after another. And he went further. He, began, he, he, he went to showing how the interpretations that I was used to giving as in my reform tradition just didn't make sense in so many cases. But, but anyway, let's hear the passages. These are some of the passages that I began to run into in Scripture and want to hear. Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. For we have come to share in Christ, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Yeah, and that always takes me to the book of Revelation and the letters to the churches. You know, you have forsaken your first love. Uh, the yeah, confidence you had at first. Um yeah, yeah, return a, to it. Return to it. Clear yeah, or I'll as day come and me. I'll take your candlestick away, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, in chapter six of Hebrews, the author talks about, and now I'm quoting, those who, quote, have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted of the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. And he talks about how if they fall away, it's basically impossible to win them back. I mean, believe it or not. The interpretation that I was taught and that I had come to understand within the Reformed tradition is that these people being described here, okay, they've once been enlightened, right? Well, that doesn't mean that they were actually Christians. Oh, okay. They've tasted the heavenly gift. Well, taste, it doesn't mean they had actually received the heavenly gift. Um, they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Well, that just means that they were around um, you know, like the congregation where the Holy Spirit was present and, and active. They have tasted of the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. Again, that just means that they were around and they they heard sermons. And things. You understand what I'm saying, Matt? It's oh, like, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to describe someone who was born again, 
and someone who was definitely a Christian, I don't think you could think of phrases that would be that would more explicitly convey that idea than they've once been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift, they've become partakers of the Holy Spirit, they've tasted of the goodness of the Word of God, the powers of the age to come. These are Christians, and yet he's describing them as those who have this this experience and then have fallen away. It's like uh, what Gerstner's accusation was of Scott Hahn. Well, maybe he just never had it in the first place. Yeah, he must have um, you know, never had and, it. And this is the way that uh, the whole doctrine of election explains the idea of people falling away. Well, that it was never real in the first place. Well, if you've tasted of the heavenly gift and received the Holy Spirit, then you have. Um, well, being a partaker of the Holy Spirit, it, it just means that the Holy Spirit came into your room, Matt, and never came into your heart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, one more. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And there's so many of these in the New Testament, but time forbids. St. Paul writes, And you, who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. And there are many, many, many more as well. But can I give you one from the Old Testament? Sure. Just to round us out. And this is straight out of Ezekiel chapter 18 with verse 21. As if it weren't clear enough from everything you just heard. If a wicked man turns from all the sins he has committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. And then in verse 24. But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty of and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. I mean, <laughs> but of course you, know you can lose your salvation. That's under the law. No, we'll, we'll oh, yeah, that's how, that. you we'll, got, that's how you would have we'll worked around that. that, right? Okay, but taken as a whole, yep, no, that's a, it's a wonderful passage. And it's a passage I'm able to I'm able to actually listen to now, but taken as a whole, Matt, the New Testament it seemed to me more and more so clearly taught that salvation is not something that is settled at the beginning. It's conceived as a path, as a road that one must walk, and and you have to walk it to the end. And that's why I think Paul says that, you, that those who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, it's a path like the path that Noah walked, Abraham walked, Moses walked. It's faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing. I saw it in the Old Testament, and I saw it in the New Testament. And it requires and now, perseverance in doing good. And it, there's an article mm-hmm. on our site that I would refer people to by Paul Thigpen. It's called, Are You Saved? A uh, Catholic Response to a Common Protestant Question. And he likens it. Uh, to this idea of a lifeboat. Say you're on a sinking ship, the lifeboat pulls up. In one sense, you're saved when you get on the lifeboat. In another sense, you're not technically saved till the lifeboat gets you to the shore, right? Yes, so there's yes, yes. <laughs> there's that sense in yep. which there, you have to complete the process. Um, and that's clear in Scripture. Well, the tension that occurs in the Reformed tradition is because of the definition of justification as something that is not only happens at the beginning, like getting into the lifeboat, but is complete at the beginning because it, it it's a it's a declarative it's, a, it's conceived as a judicial action Christ's righteousness legally credited to the account of Matt Swain it's done yeah okay? and that's why I like your college diploma analogy because well, I feel yeah, like it yeah, communicates okay. this really well yeah that's my analogy imagine that I tell you that a college diploma Matt will be granted to you the instant you first express sincere desire to attend college, okay? Imagine that from the moment you say yes, I mean a hearty, from the heart, sincere yes to the idea of going to college, you are credited with having completed your degree and you're viewed from that moment as having graduated. It's, it's a done deal. You are saved, as it were, okay? And then imagine I come along again, again and again and again, and I tell you, oh, by the way, Matt, in order to graduate, you're going to need to attend classes and do homework and write papers and pass all your exams and all the rest. In fact, what if I admonished you? I'm thinking now of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. What if I admonished you, or Acts 20, where Paul talks to the Ephesians in this way, what if I admonished you with tears? I say, Matt, make sure you don't allow yourself to become entangled and screwing around all the time, hitting the beach every day, partying every night, going to the bowling alley, whatever it is you do. Yeah, okay? Definitely the bowling alley. 
Yeah, no, make sure you know. don't, because you will graduate from college and receive your diploma only if you persevere in your studies to the end. But okay? you gave me my diploma at the beginning. What's the deal, right? Yeah, yeah you think you might be confused? I mean, a, a little bit? Matt, on the one hand, the second you express sincere desire, you have it. You are a graduate in God's eyes. And, and then, by the way, unless you take your tests, unless you finish, in fact, please don't just mess around. You need to get your homework done or you will never graduate. Okay, it is confusing. It's only when a college diploma is something that is granted to you at the end of your college experience that it becomes natural to describe little things like attending classes, writing papers, doing homework, as though they were requirements for graduation. And this is kind of the tension. That, now, there were ways of explaining these difficult passages. There were ways of diffusing them. The only problem was these explanations, they seemed, in nearly every case, to amount to saying in one way or another that what Jesus and Paul and the other New Testament authors are saying is not what they really mean. You know, one way or another, it, they amounted to saying, well, they don't really mean what they appear to be saying. You know, for instance, I'll give you a couple of examples. Jesus says that to remain in his love, we have to keep his commandments. But surely, he doesn't mean that keeping his commandments is an actual condition for remaining in his love. Surely not. That would be justification by works. That would be salvation by works. So what Jesus really means here is, and then dot, 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 and what follows, typically, is an explanation of how what Jesus really means turns out to be something totally different than what he actually said. And the same with Paul. Sure, Paul says that God will give eternal life to those who persevere in doing good, but he doesn't mean that perseverance in doing good is an actual requirement for receiving eternal life. You hear that? I mean, sure, Paul says God will give eternal life to those who persevere in doing good, but that doesn't mean that doing good, persevering in doing good is an actual requirement. That would be salvation by works. Well, there's That's a perfectly impossible. reasonable explanation as to why Paul seems to be saying something that he doesn't actually mean and meaning something that he's not actually saying. Right. He that... just means, in fact, the explanation of Romans 2 is one that will make the ears of all who hear it tingle. We'll, we'll come back to it. But I was yeah, just going to say he wrote all his epistles on opposite day. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he just means something else. Okay. And the same with those passages in Hebrews. Yes, the author of Hebrews, he does admonish his readers to make sure that they don't allow themselves to be hardened by sin and fall away from the living God. But surely this doesn't mean that it's actually possible for a Christian to be hardened by sin and fall away from the living God. He just means, again, dot, dot, fill in dot. your Fill in your Reformed you know, doctrine that you have to work everything into. And yeah, shoehorn, and I, shoehorn yeah. all these things into, yeah, or ignore. Yeah, and I remember one, here's a question I remember wondering and thinking about. Why do we never find any of the New Testament authors sensing the need to explain to their readers how what they're saying about the requirement of obedience doesn't contradict justification by faith alone? Follow what I'm saying? I mean, none of them seem to feel the need to, when they, when they say God is not mocked, a man will sow, I mean, a man will reap what he sows, Paul never stops and says, and by the way, this doesn't contradict in any way what I've been saying about justification by faith alone. You don't find any of them sensing the need to explain how the requirement of obedience that they're setting forward or taking up your cross and following or keeping the commandments doesn't conflict with justification by faith alone. In fact, there's no evidence any of them ever even felt the need to do so. Well, as I begin to wrap up my story here today, I struggled for a long time with how to make these New Testament passages fit, really fit the view of justification that I've been taught. And over time, I began to suspect, I'll be gentle about it at this point, because we have so much more to say, I began to suspect that they don't really fit. I mean, it, it, it's, it isn't natural to speak of doing homework, passing tests, writing papers. It isn't natural to speak of these as requirements for receiving a diploma that you already have hanging on your wall because it was credited to you the moment you first expressed an interest. And in the same way, it isn't natural. It's just not natural to speak of persevering obedience, taking up cross, obedience, whatever, as requirements for receiving a salvation or as conditions for receiving a salvation that was credited to you the instant you first believed. 
there just isn't a natural fit. It's, it, it's something that you have to kind of work really hard to make it fit because both Old and New Testaments really do seem to teach that to receive the blessing of God, including the inheritance of eternal life, we must turn to Christ, we must believe in him, take up our cross, and follow him, keep his commandments, and persevere in the obedience of faith to the end, by his grace, just like Noah did, just like Abraham did, just like all the saints have. As Paul said, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And it's at this point the objections just come flying fast and, and furious. But does not Paul explicitly and repeatedly state that we are justified by faith in Christ and not by works? That's number one. We'll look at this one next week. And here's another one. How can God accept an obedience that is never even close to being perfect in this life? I mean, God is infinitely holy, is he not? And does not God require perfect holiness of those who would enter his presence? We certainly taught that in the holiness church. And isn't this why Christ's perfect righteousness needs to be legally credited to you? Because in this life, you will never come close to the perfect holiness God requires. Yeah. So how can God accept an obedience that is so flailing and up and down and filled with sin? That's another objection that we'll look at. Yeah, and, and there are one many more. more. Yeah. One more here that I'm going to list is what about the fact that we are justified by the legal imputation of Christ's righteousness? So that's what the Bible teaches. If we have been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ from the moment we first believed, how can what we do after that moment, taking up our cross, being obedient or not, how can that function as a condition for receiving what we have already we received? Already yeah. yeah. In but you're still the, a snow-covered dungho, right? You know, it's just cosplay. You know, it's just, you know, wearing a Jesus costume and sneaking into heaven, you know? Um, yeah, it, that would be a pejorative way of describing the uh, what they consider to be the most beautiful doctrine in the entire I, I didn't, corpus uh, of evangelical theology. Yeah, you know. It wasn't and, the best way to present it. Uh, but, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. what's interesting to me, and, you know, as a Catholic now, I see... I see what I would not have seen as an outsider, and that is kind of a harmony of this understanding of how we offer something to God, and he then gives it back to us or infuses mm -hmm. it with his grace, and there's this cooperative uh, mm -hmm. element to it that takes in, into account both faith and works in, in a way that has made it beautiful for me now. And we're going to make the arguments for yeah, why that though, works later. Even though, even though within the Reformed faith, these things are evil words. When you say cooperate, you're talking about synergism, and that's another evil concept. Um, but... But what? But think about at mass when we uh, when the elements are brought up, the gifts are brought up for mm -hmm. for the Eucharist. We talk about it as the wine is the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands, and it will become our yeah. spiritual drink. Um, same with the bread. But beyond that, Ken, I mean, what about the Bible itself? Do would you have as a reformed person? This is I don't want to get down a rabbit hole. Would you have a reformed person say who wrote the Bible? Well, the apostles wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You would have said there had been a cooperation there, right? Yeah. Um, yes, because I, I wouldn't have wanted to say that they were just like zombies that went into outer trance, space and, yeah. and got in a trance and God just moved their hand. Everyone knows that the, that the writer's various personalities and styles of writing and all that are they brought are something. Paul brought something of Paul yeah. to his letters, and that's valuable. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, as a well, Catholic, I view this thing, very differently, so. Yeah, I mean, more, more rabbit holes, but just one thing that pops to my mind. Even reading Luther, Luther talked about how in creation, God has designed it so that man cooperates with him. Think about procreation. Of course. H human beings cooperate with God in producing another human life. And yet when it comes to salvation, this has got to be just completely sequestered off. off. Yeah. It's like a, it's a, a totally different animal. When it comes to salvation... No form of cooperation is possible. In order for it to be gracious, the grace of God, and not something of works, not something we've earned, something we could boast in for all eternity, it must be that we are justified by the legal imputation of Christ's righteousness by faith alone. Or maybe there's no another possibility, obedience. and that God has given us this gift of procreation, this gift of cooperating in every other aspect as, mm -hmm. uh, of, of our lives as a way of showing us how he operates with us 
in the world of salvation. So, in, in I mean, the spiritual realm. Yeah, this could be like a twenty-part series if we if we're not careful, Ken. Um. Well, in fact, Luther. Oh, I got to say one more thing because in fact, Luther he talked about procreation. Then he talks about farming too, and he says that the farmer goes out and digs holes and puts a seed in the ground and waters and cooperates with God, and yet God brings life and and brings it up. Saint then he Paul talks talked about in those very same terms. And so, yeah. well, this is where we're going. The Catholic view is that these are types, these are illustrations, these are ana- metaphors of how God deals with us in totality, in our spiritual lives, in the world, and all of that. But anyway, we'll continue on next week. We don't want this to be like a four-hour episode, so we better stop now. Yeah, and I don't want to blunt the lesson of this one, which is simply that it's very, very clear that this pattern of faith leading to obedience, resulting in blessing, is, was not a pattern that ends at the end of uh, the, the last Old Testament book, mm-hmm. but is a pattern that you can see very clearly continuing right through the New Testament as well. Well, hopefully you've gotten something out of this. Uh, if you appreciate this episode, um, then subscribe to our channel here at the Coming Home Network. Tell your friends, spread the word, and uh, let them know that we have tons and tons of free resources at chnetwork.org. That's the website of the Coming Home Network. Over a thousand stories of people who've come from every background imaginable into the Catholic faith, and we would love to hear from you as well. And until then, I'm Matt Swaim. Ken Hensley, thanks again for another excellent deep dive into your own personal background. Great to be with you, Matt. This is always good.